thank you, worship team. Um, I'd like to let all of you know that three of the members of our worship team tonight, Anton, Cecily, and Grace, the three up front here, are all students that are part of our Leadership Institute this summer. They're serving internships here at FPCG, so it's great to have them uh, help lead us in worship. Great to see their growth. It's so exciting to see 13 young people uh, investigating whether or not God is calling them into careers and ministry, and we think that's part of our our God-given responsibility as a church is to identify and develop next-generation leadership. So uh, thanks for leading us in worship tonight, you guys. Well, many of you know that I grew up uh, in the church, and you're going to enjoy this, Ellen. Ellen actually grew up in the same church I did years ago, but I grew up in the church. And when I say that, I mean that in two distinctive ways. First, I grew up in the church in the sense that my father was a pastor, and the church was the very center of our lives. The center of everything we did was the church. We're in church three, four times a week. That was just normal for me. But I also mean that for in a way that uh, most people don't, in that for a few years of my childhood, our family actually lived in the church. Now, this is what Hillside Church looked like in the late 1960s. Does that look familiar, Ellen? Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is a little church about 40 miles north of New York City in a small town called Armonk. And the parsonage, which is an old-fashioned word for a place of living given to the pastor and his family was actually attached to the church. Go put the, leave it up there for a little while. Uh, our parsonage was on the right side of that building, attached. So we lived in the part with the two dormers. The sanctuary was right underneath the steeple. Um, and that caused, my, our bus stop was right in front of the church where my brother and I would get on the bus. And so our classmates in school figured out we lived in the church. And that was a source of never-ending teasing because it would be church mice, church mouse, uh, all that stuff. And it didn't really bother me, I don't recall, because I thought I had the coolest house of anybody I knew. We had the biggest house of anybody I knew. Nobody had the stuff that we had to play with, but we lived actually in the church. It would be as if our family now lived here in the student center and a hallway down there, and then there was a sanctuary. Th- that was like it was, only much, much smaller. Our living quarters were separated from the sanctuary by a small, very short hallway, and then my dad's office. So my brother Joe and I were about 11 and 8 years old at that time, and our bedroom was upstairs in the parsonage side of the building. Now, our church always had Wednesday night prayer meeting when I was growing up. It was just a staple of the church calendar, Wednesday night prayer meeting. My dad would always lead it. He was the pastor. My mom would always go because prayer was important to her. It was small. Maybe 30 people would show up on Wednesday nights, and they would pray for an hour or so. My brother and I were uh, exempt from Wednesday night prayer meeting, which was, at least for a while until we got old enough, uh, which was good because we were 11 and 8, old enough not to need a babysitter just for that one hour of prayer meeting. So we were home alone during that time, but in the same building, but just in our our half of it, okay? Um, Now, in the couple of years we lived in the church, we explored every nook and cranny in the whole building. We knew everything about it. We knew where all the hiding places were, where all the hide-and-seek places were. We knew everything about the building including a very small closet upstairs in what we called our guest bedroom. Now, we hardly ever used that bedroom, but we knew about this little closet there, and it had a really unusual sloped floor, tiny little closet, sloped floor. And that was because the floor of that closet was actually the ceiling of the sanctuary in the church, which had a pitched roof like our sanctuary does. It was like this, and the closet located there, so it had a a really steeply angled floor. Furthermore, we noticed when we got really down on the actual floor of the closet, there were little knot holes in the, in the wood. And we could see through the knot holes right down into the sanctuary. Okay, so we just knew that. That was our little secret. Well, one Wednesday night, uh, we were home alone, and um, one thing led to another. We went up to that closet, and we started spying. We called it spying. It's what kids do. We were spying on prayer meeting, just staring, just looking down the holes at the, at the faithful you know, saints down there praying, probably for us as for, or for all we knew. We could see the back of their heads. You know, they're all kneeling down praying. We were just, oh, there's so-and-so, there's so-and-so, there's so-and-so. And then, I don't know whose idea it was. My brother would blame it on me. I blame it on him. We started making little paper wads. We made them little, really small ones, and we, could, we were dropping them through the knot hole, watching them, trying to land them on the lady's hair. <laughs> it was big fun. It was big fun. Uh, but it wasn't very nice, and it wasn't very smart. It never dawned on us that the people were going to have no problem guessing who was doing that. <laughs> we were the only people had access to that part of the building, and we were the only ones not in prayer meeting. So someone uh, passed on to my father the phenomenon of paper falling from the 
sky. And that night, as I recall, my brother and I had our own special prayer meeting. <laughs> we're in a series now called The Way of Blessing, Kingdom of God in Everyday Life. And as we're looking into the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, we're seeing how Jesus describes what the kingdom of God should look like as his followers live it out every day in their lives, in their families, in their homes, in their neighborhoods. And he's talked about influence, how we are to be like salt and light in our neighborhoods. We are to be influences for preservation, uh, influences of truth and light, how, we, uh, how there is purity in the way of blessing, how the kingdom of God shapes uh, our understanding and our practice of even our sexuality and our relationships. Pastor Jeff preached on that a couple of weekends ago. It would be good for you to go back and watch that if you didn't get to hear that sermon. You can go online to our website and hear it. We saw in, uh, him talk about generosity, how generosity lies at the heart of everything good God wants to do in us and in his kingdom. And today we're going to look at what he says about prayer. Now, prayer is a huge topic. Uh, much of the New Testament can be used to teach on prayer, and we've dealt with it uh, many times in a series of messages. Most recently, back in the wintertime, when we did a series on prayer in the story of Jesus, we're looking at a small snippet here in the Sermon on the Mount. You're going to recognize if you were there in the, back in the winter when we taught on prayer, parts of this message were also in that message. But this is Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Now in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus is teaching the, about the difference between what might be called outward religion and genuine inner faith. And he starts this whole section off in chapter 6 of Matthew by saying this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then in rapid succession, he deals with uh, topics like generosity, and then prayer, and then fasting. And he deals with each of them in the same way, saying that if we practice these things in order to impress people, uh, in order to appear religious, then that's all we'll ever get out of those behaviors. Because God is not interested so much in our external religious behavior. Now, let's continue on. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. You're going to recognize a portion of this passage uh, because many of you have been repeating these words most of your life. Jesus says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Okay, I'm going to stop there and just teach three things that we need to understand about prayer, sort of a primer on prayer from Jesus' point of view. First, prayer is not a performance. Prayer is not a performance. When I was about 25 years old, um, I knew that God had called me into ministry of some sort. I just didn't know what shape that call was supposed to take. So I was working my way through grad school, sort of one year at a time, uh, trying to just figure things out. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And that summer, my father helped me get a seven-week uh, ministry internship in uh, a, a fairly large inner-city church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he was able to do that because he knew the pastor of this church, uh, had been longtime friends of his, and so he allowed me to join their staff sort of, as a, sort of as an intern for that summer. It was a great experience for me in many, many ways, uh, and was sort of the seed of what we call Leadership Institute here at FBCG today, because I saw the impact it could have on a young person trying to figure out what God was doing in his life. Well, the senior pastor of that church, my dad's friend, was a really interesting fellow. He'd been a pastor by this time for about 30 years and carried himself with kind of this, this odd air of authority and superiority and just oddness. Uh, behind his back, his staff called him the bishop, and it was just perfect, uh, the bishop. He had a doctorate, had written books, uh, seemed like he was born in a suit and tie. I don't think I ever saw him without a, uh, without a tie on. 
except when we played racquetball one time. He just killed me, which just irritated me. Um, there was something fierce and intimidating about his very demeanor, so I was never quite comfortable around him. Plus, he knew, I knew that he knew my dad really well and so forth, but he gave me this opportunity. I still remember the very first staff meeting we had when I was there that summer. There were just four of us in the pastor's office. The pastor, myself, the youth pastor, and I think the worship leader, who was, who was a lady. So we're sitting there in front of his desk, he, and, and uh, waiting for it to start, and I figured, uh, you know, I didn't know really what a staff meeting was going to be like. So he comes into the meeting, and he slowly gets up out of his chair behind his desk and kind of makes a big deal out of kneeling down at his chair, beh- kind of behind it. He just disappeared. He kneeled down by his chair behind his desk. And I didn't know what I was supposed to do. My first meeting, are we supposed to kneel down too? What's, what's going to happen here? So I looked at the youth pastor. He looked at me and he just went, like, just, just stay there. So we, I, we just stayed there. And then the pastor launched into this very uh, formal and eloquent prayer. I'll, I'll quote some of it a little bit later. And when he finished, he didn't leave room for anybody else to pray. Nobody else prayed. He just finished. Made the same big deal about getting up and groaning and get back into his chair. And then the meeting started. And all summer long, every week, that was how staff meeting happened. Only he prayed, he knelt down, only he knelt down, and then we had staff meeting. It was very clear to me at that time that uh, this is the way it was. He was the pastor. He was the bishop. He was the holy one. He was the one who prayed. He was the only one who could appropriately address uh, God himself. And we were just there to sort of listen in and watch the show. Now, studies show that almost everyone prays. The Gallup polls show that 9 out of 10 Americans say they pray on a weekly basis. And that proportion, by the way, hasn't changed in our culture in 50 years. 9 out of 10 people say they pray on a weekly basis. 3 out of 4 say they pray every day. The Pew Research Center says that even among the religiously unaffiliated, those are people who don't go to church anywhere, they claim 20% of them say they pray every day. They don't even go to church. Now, we pray in lots of ways. We pray in church. We pray before meals. We pray when people we love are sick. We pray when we need help. Uh, We pray for jobs. We pray for money. We pray for all kinds of things in all kinds of ways. But Jesus here is talking about a specific kind of prayer. Look what he says, verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Now, what does Jesus mean by hypocrites. Interestingly, that word translated into English as hypocrites has its origins in the Greek theater. It describes an actor, a character, who would wear a mask. So our best understanding today might be a pretender, those who are pretending to be someone they are not. Okay, These are people pretending to pray Jesus says. There are people pretending to be devoted to God, to be devoted to prayer, in order to achieve a certain reputation. He's talking about people who see prayer as a means to an end, to appear religious, to be seen as pious and holy, to receive respect and attention. They turn prayer into kind of a religious performance. I think that's a little bit of what I saw in those staff meetings many years ago. When I listened to prayers that went kind of like this, just imagine. O God, from whom all holy desires and all just works proceedeth, givest unto thy humble servant that peace which the world giveth not, that our hearts may may us be set free to obey thy commandments, and that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance through the merits of Christ our Lord. I was like, huh? What if we conducted our most important relationships that same way? If you're married, if you're a married man, for example, I'm a married man, what if we, we woke up every day, guys, and said something like this to our wives? Good morning, dear spouse and conjugal partner. Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, to whom I have pledged my love and fealty both now and forever. May you have a blessed day. May you manage this household with diligence. Some of you are like, well, that's better than us a coffee on yet, hon. You know. <laughs> what if you started every day with the exact same words, day after day after day? Would those words, however flowery, create a sense of intimacy and relationship? Of course not. We don't want just words. No matter how beautiful they are, we want someone's heart. Jesus says God is the same way, so don't pray like that. Don't pray like the hypocrites. Don't pray for show. Don't pray pretending. God is interested in our these and our thous. He doesn't care about being beseeched. He wants our hearts. Prayer is not a performance, Jesus says. 
Secondly, he says prayer is not magic. It's not magic. Let me try to explain. How many of you recognize the name Robert Tilton? Anybody? Anybody recognize this guy? A few of you? I hope you're shaking your heads like, oh, yeah, I do. Okay. Anyway, let me tell you about Robert Tilton. He was a TV evangelist and scam artist who was at his peak in the late 80s and early 90s, mostly in the southern United States. He had a television show, a cable television show, called Success in, the letter N, Life. Success in Life. And Tilton's ministry consisted of convincing his viewers, particularly the less educated and less affluent, to make a prayer vow. See it right there on the screen? Can you put that back up on the screen? It says, call now to make a vow. What he meant by making a vow was pledging an amount of money. His favorite amount was $1,000. You made a vow to pledge money to his ministry, and in return, God would guarantee he would answer the prayer you sent in with that vow. You hear what I'm saying? He became a millionaire many times over. Okay? He turned prayer into a formula. He turned prayer into sort of a magic show. He turned prayer into that which manipulated God into giving you your request plus a kickback in money. Now, he was eventually sued for fraud, and when officials investigated his ministry, they one time found 10,000 pounds of letters in a dumpster. His staff sliced them open, took out the check, and threw the request away. Okay, that's what they did. This is what Jesus is talking about. Listen to what he says in verse 7. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now here Jesus is referring to a pagan form of prayer. The chanting of incantations based on the idea that repeating a prayer with the right words over and over again will achieve the favor of the gods, small g. Jesus is saying that God, big G, creator of heaven and earth, isn't interested in prayer formulas or in ritual prayers designed to win his favor. He's teaching that God wants prayer to be personal and intimate, born out of a genuine relationship with him. Now, some of you grew up in or spent years in churches where you were taught to repeat certain prayers over and over again. For example, like the Lord's Prayer which we're going to get to in just a moment at the end of this passage. Does this mean that all that was wrong? Not necessarily, but it does mean that Jesus is much more interested in prayers that comes from, come from our heart than in prayers that can be recited, uh, wrote by memory without engaging our hearts at all. A key to understanding this is when he says, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, if you're thinking with me, you should be asking, well, then why do we pray? Why do we even need to pray? If God knows what we need before we ask Him, why pray? Because prayer is not about getting things from God. At least not what Jesus is saying. That's not what it's about. Prayer is, about, is not about convincing God to do things for us by showing Him how sincere we are through our religious behavior, by repeating prayers, by giving money, by denying ourselves through fasting. All those can be good and wonderful things to do. But Jesus' point here is that we are not to see religious activity as a kind of magic that manipulates God in doing what we want Him to do. He already knows what we need because He already knows us. Prayer is about a relationship with God. That leads us to the third point Jesus is teaching us today. Prayer is a relationship. It's not performance. It's not magic, but it is a relationship. Now, I've shared this story before a number of times, but I want to tell it again because it was a turning point in my own understanding of prayer. Even though I grew up in the church, grew up hearing prayer all my life, this, this particular moment was a watershed moment for me. I was a few months after my internship experience. I was 25 or 26, becoming increasingly frustrated with what I would call the pace of God's decision-making. Have you ever felt like that? You know, he, he, just, was, he, he just dragging his feet. He needed some course on administration or something. He he just needed to get with the program, particularly to get with my program. So one night I decided I was going to pray until I got an answer. What do you want me to do? It was sort of my prayer ultimatum. So I started praying that night by myself in my uh, apartment in all the right ways, in all the words I'd been taught, all the words I learned growing up, all the besieges and the these and thous and and all that stuff. Said all the right words in the way I thought I was supposed to pray, 
and just nothing. Nothing. You ever feel like there's like a prayer jamming device, like just bouncing off the ceiling? Nothing. My words seemed to just bounce off the ceiling. And it went on like this for a while. I was really trying hard. I was really sincere here. And then I did something I'd never done before. I went out on the back deck of my little apartment that was, that was outside. And I looked up at the night sky. And I just kind of lost it. I started just shouting at God. Out loud. Shouting. And I, I said some very, some profoundly unspiritual things. Have you ever seen Forrest Gump? The scene where, where Lieutenant Dan is in the storm, screaming at God. It wasn't quite that bad, but go watch that scene. That's what I felt like. Okay? I'm trying here. I'm trying. What are you doing? And I said things I should never say. I was taught never to say to God. I was aghast. I couldn't believe I said that. And before I could apologize and get those words back, I sensed the voice of God, the presence of God, and this is what he did. One of the few times in my life I can say I, I sensed his voice. He said, he didn't say a word at first, he just chuckled. He, it was God chuckling. I know the sound of God chuckling. And then he said, you, <laughs> you have finally been honest with me. Now we can do business. And I learned something that night. I learned that God didn't want my words. He didn't want me to say what I thought I should say. He wanted my heart. He wanted all of it. Complete honesty, right on the table. He wanted everything. And he was big enough to handle it. I learned something that night. Changed how I prayed from then on. Within a couple of months, interestingly, I had my first job in ministry, and I met the woman, and I eventually became my wife. She's sitting right down here. Jesus says in verse 6, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Go into your room and close the door. The Greek word for room here is tamion, which means an inner storage chamber or secret room. In that culture at that time, it would have been something like what we would call a pantry or a closet. Very small room for storing a few set of things. Cramped little space, but intensely private. As he often did, Jesus is using an everyday illustration. Everybody knew what this was in their homes to make a profoundly spiritual point. While God hears the prayers we offer in public, while he cares about the prayers we offer in church, while he listens to the words we say when others are listening, he's far more interested in what we're willing to say to him in private, in our secret place. You know, Jesus also had his own secret place. Scripture tells us he often went to lonely places, to desolate places to pray. Many scholars believe this is one of Jesus' favorite places to play, pray. It's called the Eremus Cave. It's just up from the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it's actually the name Eremus means desolate place. Some people think this is exactly the place where he would go to get away from the, everything, just to sit in that cave and pray. From this spot, he could look out over the Sea of Galilee. And when you sit in that cave looking out, you think, what a perfect place to sit with your father all day long or all night long and pray. So I wonder, do you have a favorite secret place of prayer? Do you have a prayer closet or a prayer pantry? Now, it might be your daily commute on the train or in the car. One of my favorite places is in my car to pray. Windows are up. Nobody can hear me yell and rant and rave and whatever I'm doing in prayer except the one I want to hear. Do you have a favorite place? Might be your kitchen table, might be your back porch, might be walking around your neighbor. Do you have a place where you go, where you know he waits for you? It's important. The point is that the closet is free from interruption, free from distraction, and from other listening ears. A place where you can open your secrets to your Father who hears in secret. Jesus is saying that prayer is a deeply personal conversation. And it's in that context then that we read these words, the multiple prayer. Let me read them for you again in this context. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now we call, we call this, of course, the Lord's Prayer. Consider the most beautiful prayer written in almost any language and rightfully so. But something funny has happened to the Lord's Prayer, to these words since Jesus gave us to them 2,000 years ago. It's become perhaps the most memorized and repeated prayer in all of human history. Now remember what Jesus has been teaching. 
Prayer is not a religious performance. Prayer is not the repetition of religious words like a formula, like a mantra. So we can assume he wasn't intending to give us a prayer that we could repeat over and over again without thinking about it. That wasn't his point. He was giving us a model, a guide for personal secret prayer. He's telling us not what words to say, but what our prayers are to be about. First, worship. Acknowledging who we are praying to. Our Father, he says. We don't pray to the big guy. We don't pray to the man upstairs. I hate that expression. We don't pray to the man upstairs. We don't pray to the earth or to the stars or to the wind or to the sea. As magnificent as those things are, they're all created things. We don't pray to human beings who died 500 years ago, who did wonderful things in their lifetime. We pray to our Father in heaven. There's one destination for prayer and one only. Jesus establishes that in the first few words. Second, asking for daily needs. It's okay to ask. We ask for our daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Confession. Forgive us and help us to forgive others. You notice Jesus connects always our reception of God's forgiveness with our capacity to forgive others. They are connected. He acknowledges that in his prayer. Help in temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but lead us in the way of purity. He says, thy kingdom come. Submission to his will. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's surrendering myself and my way of living, my decisions, my life, my relationships, my family, my words to his kingdom and his kingship. So I make his kingdom evident in the way that I live. It's surrender. teaching us how we are to pray. I want to wrap up with a, one more story. Years ago, we had a special time of prayer. I think it was on a Sunday after services for a woman at our church. She suffered from a chronic disease and had endured dozens of surgeries, um, many years of suffering and pain, um, and now she was facing uh, a major organ transplant. So we gathered with her, her family, uh, for prayer, Some right in the room right over here, what we call the chapel now. Our purpose was to... Was to Ask the Lord for healing as she went through this surgery. It's what we all do. Many of you have done that. We do this on a weekly basis at church. And that's what we did. Partway, as I recall, partway through the time of prayer, several of us had prayed, and then partway through the time of prayer, um, her husband spoke up and began to pray. Only he didn't pray for his wife. Not at first. This is what he said. He said, Lord, Forgive me for this terrible anger I have harbored against you all these years. And the whole room changed. Why? Because he had just invited us into his secret place. He just opened up the room of his secret room so we could hear what he needed to say to his Father in heaven. And we were in the very presence of Jesus from that point on. That's the way of prayer. Would you bow with me as I close? Lord Jesus, thank you today for your word, for inviting each one of us into a relationship with yourself, a relationship marked not by religious behavior, but by honesty, vulnerability, forgiveness, grace, and love. Forgive us for sometimes giving you only our external religiosity. Teach us instead to give you our hearts in prayer. Meet each one of us in our inner room, our secret room, that we might know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.